Hi, everyone. Robert Rutherford. We're at episode 24 already. Have Mike Colom in here from Rutherford Co. Inc. He's the general superintendent over there, and he's going to have a great story. He's been in the industry for a long time. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Rob, I'm good, buddy. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you very much for taking some time out of your day to come over here and tell your story. My pleasure. So we met, like we were talking about, in the early 80s. Right. And you were actually a sub foreman on this hospital that we were working on. Yeah, Les Bennett was running the show. No finesse and less, <laughs> as <laughs> no. Mike Moulton would say. Yeah, Les just, uh, you know, he called it like he saw it and didn't care if you liked it or not. Yeah, he was very sharp. Which was okay. I learned a lot from Les. Yeah, that was a, a massive project. Was that the first job that you were a sub foreman on? Yeah, that fucker was difficult, dude. There, there was, was a lot of challenges. studs in that in that building. Yeah. I mean you could you couldn't even see through the other side. There were so many studs. Right. It was fucking crazy. It was six stories and there was I think the ground floor was administration and then uh, the fourth floor was operating and the rest of it was patient rooms. And then the morgue. So what's that? The morgue down in the basement, yeah, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was um very, I learned a lot of shit there, man. I, I think I was out there for two fucking years. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of steps to that thing. And uh, it's where I met the Valenis. Yeah. I think that was the first project that they had worked on for Rutherford out there. It was Bob and Tom. Yeah. And they were doing the envelope ceilings in the basement. Yep. Yep. And um, I, I started working on the first and second floor with Tom on those ceilings i remember making those light boxes right <laughs> there's a million of those oh my things. god it was uh very intense very intense and i remember also too you know slip track wasn't invented yet and we were doing uh two piece you know nested track and we were we were going up every four foot with with the mains up to the deck on that right remember that yeah and then filling it in with channel and capping the tops off because of all the envelope ceilings in the main corridors. Right. That was crazy. Yeah, it was challenging. There was a lot of work to it. And those, uh, those slip, uh, the nested track was 14 gauge. Mm -hmm. So we had challenges getting it to go into the concrete. We didn't have all the options we have today with fasteners. Sure, sure. Uh, and we were using the, if you remember, we were using the high V gun. Yep. Remember? And we double load that bad boy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, blow your head clean off. Yeah. That was so stupid. But, hey, we got away with it. Well, we had to. That was some hard concrete for new concrete. I mean, it was high PSI. So that was the only thing that we could do to, to make that happen. get her done, right? Yeah. Well, we used purple loads and tried not to double load it if we didn't have to. But yeah. you get that, that obstinate one. It was just a little stubborn. You know, fix your ass. Yeah. You double load that bad boy. <laughs> Yeah, how do you like me now? Yeah, they yeah. drive that thing right home. Yeah, yeah, that was uh so that that's a little bit of our history on on working on some jobs together, you know, when we first met. Right. What were you doing before you got into laughing? Uh before I got into laughing, I went to school that I wanted to be out of high school, I went into college, I wanted to be a firefighter. Oh really? Uh, so I got my degree in fire science and then I was taken uh tests at the different you know, fire uh, you know cities different you know municipalities i tried to i would really want to be a fireman mm -hmm. i thought i had what it took i felt like it was my calling and i my goal was to be at 28 years old to be a captain for la county fire holy shit that was my goal wow said, i'm going to be the youngest captain in the history of la county and that was my goal wow and i, I was determined to do it so and in the meantime, after I got out of school, I was working uh, on a, uh, for J.C. Penney's on a loading dock. Then this guy, I, they, they came in there, and uh, we were opening up a new store. So they had the, this operations manager kind of took a liking to me and said, hey, start building all this shit. And I said, okay. So he gave me a you know, toolbox and a bunch of stuff. I was building you know, bassinets and bicycles and whatever he wanted to have built to put on the store. So they had nothing. It was a brand new store. Mm -hmm. So this guy comes in and uh, he, he had a bicycle building company and they would go to the, they would contract with the different stores and he'd get the whole chain. Mm. 
You know, like he did all the J.C. Penney's in Southern California kind of thing. So he came and talked to me and said, hey, you know, if you want to try something, I got a job for you. So I thought about it and I thought, you know, okay, for right now, you know, what the heck? So it was a 50-50 deal for every bike that I assembled. I got $3.50 for a 10 speed and I got $2.75 for uh, anything under that stingray or that kind of bike you know sure and uh so he gave me some stores and and i went in and he trained me how to build them we had to use torque wrenches and we were and we had to build the bikes to spec Mm -hmm. so we we weren't it was it was it was a bit of a science you know it was a legitimate thing sure so i started with him i was the fifth guy that he hired and as time went on i worked you know i i worked my way up in his company and at one point in time i was in part i was part of the western half of the united states no I was shit. looking after that wow yeah so my brother and i and ron came on and he was working with me oh is that right yeah he got tired of what he was doing so we were we were making 20 grand a year back in the, the late 70s no shit. 78 79 somewhere we we're making 20 grand a year building bikes wow so we'd go into these stores and uh, I got chummy with the store managers or the managers of the departments there, and they'd get freight damage come in, mm-hmm. you know, and the stuff would stack up. Well, so this one particular guy got, he they would get audited by their super there by their county or their district managers would come in, and they wanted to see those clo- those those stores clean as a whistle. So he'd tell me, he goes, "There's freight damage. Get those fucking things out of here." All right, so I'd take, I had a truck at that time, so I'd load my truck up with all this freight damaged bikes. I'd take them home and piece them all together, and I'd get a, I, I could put together a brand new 10 speed. I mean, brand new, right out of the box. The wheel was bent or the crank was twisted. So if I get a new crank, I get a new wheel. Mm-hmm. And I was making, I would go down to the swap meet there on Saturday and Sunday morning, Saturday morning, go down to the swap meet and I had parts and stuff like that. And I'd go down with five or six. I waited until I had five or six bikes. I'd go down there and make seven, 800 bucks. No shit. Back then. Back then. You were kicking ass, I'd dude. I'd sell the bikes for, you know, a hundred bucks a pop. Wow. Kind of thing, you know, maybe 125, something yeah. like that. Which was, you know, the, they were up over two hundred bucks in the store. Wow! So free yeah. inventory, and man. And it was it was total pure profit, man. Wow! You know, so hey, you know, yeah, I was doing I was doing okay along with the twenty grand I was making. Yeah, and I was making that stuff under the table. That was cash. So as time went on, I kept, you know, working at the fire department, and and I realized, hey, I'm not getting any younger, and this job isn't something that I can have a family and, and that kind of stuff it's just not a it's not that kind of a job it's a stopgap job mm-hmm. so i was a little bit desperate you know, and i'm starting to i was 23 years old and i'm thinking she, you know i don't know if i'm ever gonna make it in that damn fire department thing you know i just i was standing in my old man's backyard and we were over on a saturday afternoon i was married at the time and uh, we were barbecuing and and i was bullshitting with him and i said you know out of the blue I said, maybe I might, I might like to try what you're doing. And he says, you want a job? And I said, yeah, I think I want to try it. And he goes, okay, I'll let you know when the job comes up that it's good for you to start on. Mm-hmm. So he says, in the meantime, keep doing what you're doing, and I'll let you know. So August, or so uh, April 19th, 1980, I got my first call. And I went out to Latterman State Hospital. And that was my first day on the job. First week I was there, Friday rolled around, and I knew this was for me. Yeah, you knew, yeah. Well, you kind of grew up around it. So we're, you know, Ronnie was in here telling the story about your family, right. you know, that yeah. you guys were in the industry. Your family was in the industry for a long time. Yeah, we've got and, a lot of history in it. Yeah, for sure. I was very surprised. I didn't know any of that stuff. And would you go out and... and work in the summers you know scrapping out and stuff like that uh my dad took took us out once in a while you know mm-hmm. but then we, as we got a little bit older we'd go in and clean up the yard at, at uh, dan siffling laughing which was where my dad was the superintendent at the time mm-hmm. so we'd go in there and clean up the yard and they'd come out and give us lists and we'd load trucks and that sort of thing and mm-hmm. keep things cleaned up and work during the summer sparingly you know a couple yeah. of, a couple of weeks out of the out of the summer we'd mm-hmm. work out there we had to be careful we don't get hurt yeah we were still young got it got it yeah. But so you, you know, it was kind of in your blood. Yeah. I, I knew, I knew the materials. Mm-hmm. I knew what a 
20 gauge stud was, you know, I knew, I knew what narrow flange plaster studs were. Yeah. I knew what stud shoes were before I went out on the job. Mm -hmm. Now I couldn't put them together and actually, but I knew what they were. So yeah. when I saw them, I said, those are stud shoes. Yeah. Kind of thing. So I came out of the gate having that knowledge. A little bit. Yeah. I knew, I knew most of the materials mm -hmm. before I went to the job site. Got it. Got it. So it's kind of a, a, you know, having that in your blood and your dad doing it and your, your family mm -hmm. was doing it that, um, you just didn't gravitate to that as, as a kid, you know, being around it kind of your whole life, yeah. you know, and wanting to go in this other direction. And, um, you, the first week you were out there, you knew it was for you. Yeah. I couldn't wait for Monday. No shit. Yeah. Wow. Was that a fucked up job he put you on? No. Great Gravy. Job. Gravy job, huh? Oh, it was great. Yeah. I had a time of my life there. I met Sean Cooney. Uh, Manuel Tovar was the foreman, Mike Moulton, um, Grant Kirk, and Mike Gindrich. And those guys were solid guys. And all those guys, uh, Mike Gindrich took off on his own and is very successful, has his own construction company. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest of the guys are all top-notch guys, and they're, run they're running companies themselves. Mm -hmm. So all of us, that group of guys right there was a pretty special group. Yeah. And I'm just proud to be part of that. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, those were lifelong friends for you. I've known those guys for four, 40 years now. Yeah. I'm 40 years in. That's amazing. In dude. April. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And we lost, we lost our brother Grant this uh, year. It broke my heart. Which was, uh, devastating. Yeah. Yeah. That hurt. Yeah. But, uh, he, so he, how long was he in the trade when you met him? Was he a journeyman already? Oh, Grant? Yeah. No, he started after me. Oh, okay. He Got came it. out there about maybe a month. Uh huh. So we were real close to, to starting at the same time. And Sean and Mike had time in out there. And so, and Mike Moulton, Mike Enrich, Mike Moulton, and Sean Cooney mm -hmm. had probably, I want to say maybe two years. Oh, got it. In when I got out there. Mm hmm. Got it. And so, what did they have you doing when you first got out there? Oh, I was stocking the buildings. They were all, there was a series of buildings in a campus. So they would take over a building. And then we had a central area where we stocked all our material. Emmanuel would come and give me a list and say, here, stock that building. Mm -hmm. So I'd take the list and I'd stock the building and then he would put manpower into that building. Got it. So got that it. was that was basically my job. Now, once I got everything stocked, I got to work with my tools. And that was the goal. Oh, yeah. That was always the goal. Oh, I wanted to work with my tools. Yeah. And so they, they put you learning how to read a tape measure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and starting at the bottom. So you started at the bottom, just like everybody else. They had a, a, a door opening that they had put in a concrete. It was a, con a door. They pulled it out, and they wanted to put it, uh, close it off. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, studs, and it was all lapped up. It was 307, or something like that. And so they, said, uh, they decided to keep the door opening. So Manuel had me chisel the thing out. So I chiseled it out. I put it in my truck, and I took it home, and I practiced tie and lath at home at night. Because mm -hmm. it was it was perfect. Yep. It had the lap on both sides. Sure. So I practiced tie and lap because I wanted to get good at doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I tied it to my garage door when the garage door was closed. And I opened the garage door and I practiced tying overhead. Yep. And I did that, I don't know, probably two, at least two hours every night for maybe a month. No shit. Before I got a shot. I, and I told Manuel, I told him what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So he says, okay, let's see what you can do. And so I was keeping up with the journeyman. No shit. Yeah. I was keeping up with the journeyman Good for, for you. at a 40 percenter. Wow. Money maker. So money maker. I didn't spend much time on the scrap pile. Yeah. Well, you know, and that was um, it's the same thing today. Right. Yeah. So you can pick out those cubs that are going to make you money. Right. Right. And they're going to go somewhere. You know, you look for guys that that have they ha I, I call it a, I call it it. You look for the guys that have it. Mm hmm. Yeah. I can't, I don't, you can't define it, but you know it when you see it. Absolutely. It's uh, kind of right to the point right there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And uh, did you work on a lot of jobs with Manuel? Yeah. You, I spent a lot of time with him. Did you? More, more than, more than uh, most of the other foreman that yeah, you Yeah, I spent with? most of my apprenticeship with Manuel. Got it. So did Sean and, and Mike and 
and Mike Moulton as well. Mm -hmm. Mike moved. Mike was a little further along than the rest of us, so my dad was pushing him up the ladder. Got it. Got it. And you would get you would get a lot of those guys on jobs that you were running. Yeah, well, when I started, when eventually started running work, mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, yeah, Sean and I did a lot of work together. I worked for him; he worked for me, kind mm -hmm. of thing. We had a blast. I can't say enough good things about Sean and Mike Moulton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good guys. Yeah, very, very, sharp. very dear to my heart. Yeah, yeah. When you were when you were a journeyman, how how long were you a journeyman before you ran your first job? I started running work before I turned out. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Wow. My old man was giving me little things to do. Mm hmm You know, so he was kind of seeing, you know, something that I, I could do, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he slowly built my confidence up. Mm -hmm. and so I was probably about eight stage. I probably had maybe a year and a half in. And Got he'd it. And start turning me out on my own, put mm -hmm. me on little things. Yeah. To do. Yeah. So I went through apprentice school in one year. Wow, bomb that shit out. I huh? just I doubled up by asking. The guy's name was Glenn Braglia, and he was the superintendent. Steve, I worked with Steve Braglia over the years. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Steve's up to, but uh, anyway, Glenn was a, a really good, good teacher. Mm -hmm. A really good apprentice teacher. And he was working for Raymond at the time. So he'd work all day and then come down and teach us at night. Totally different from what it is today. Oh, yeah. He gave me, he said, okay, he gave us a piece of paper with dimensions on it. You know, I want you to take these dimensions, quarter inch, half inch, seven eighths, make all these marks on the floor with distance, with this distance in between them. Then I want you to plumb each one of them up mm -hmm. onto a bar above your head. And then I'm going to come back and measure it and see how close you are. So you know what I did? I plumbed the first one up and I measured the rest of them out. Perfect. And I was done like that. Yeah. You know, and they were right on the money. And they were tits on it. <laughs> That's smart. So he, you're a thinker. He came over and he says, I know what you did. And I like the way you think. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. But do what I tell you. I thought he was going to make you a foreman. <laughs> <laughs> he said, this is, this is, thinking is good, but this is a class on doing what you're told. Mm -hmm. And that's the lesson. Got it. Do what you're told. Mm-hmm. So, so you did it. Oh, I've never forgotten it. Yeah. Yeah. That's but funny. I do encourage that guy to do that sort of thing. Today, Absolutely. The guys that work for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, now you're not using a plumb bulb. No. Yeah. It's a laser. Yeah. Right. You know, it's all, uh, you know, when you got into the trade, lasers had pretty much just come in. Yeah. Well, we, we had, I think we had a, one spinning laser mm -hmm. and you had to, you had to really uh, mess with it to get it correct and get it right on. Mm -hmm. And we, what we would do is we'd set the laser up and then we'd take it and check it with a water level. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we did because yeah. we didn't trust it. Yeah. We trusted that water level though. Well, it never lied, no. you know, as long as there wasn't a water bubble in it or somebody wasn't there. standing on it. Yeah. Right? right. So I worked on this massive job. And they had stone on the first two levels of the building. And it was giant, a million square feet of floor space. And when they got around where they were supposed to intersect, they were off. They had five fucking lasers out there. They had water levels out there. They're trying to figure out. And it was like, well, if you use the water level, you would have made it. Yeah. And they would have met. They would have intersected because those things get out of calibration. I'm sure that they've come a long way. This right. was fucking, you know, yeah. 27 years ago. Yeah. But uh, they but they were just coming into the game when, when you got in. Yeah. Right? yeah and they, and they, you, you they were, were just, giant, too. Oh, you know, yeah. Those things were massive. Yeah. You bring them in in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> set them up with a crane, yeah. you know. I'm being facetious. But yeah. They're, they were they were, uh, they they, were a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Not not out in the in the nail bag mm -mm. no and if you were using that man it, it was checked out to you <laughs> yeah yeah well, dude they were like 2500 bucks a piece or something yeah. super high dollar yeah they were you expensive yeah, actually nobody even left them in the gang box no we took them home at night yeah they went home with you yeah if you were responsible for it and you were on your job that thing went home with you mm -hmm. yeah you slept with that thing <laughs> you know? so. did you ever set it up at the house <laughs> no. You know, I did one time, I put a pool, swimming pool in my backyard 
and I, I shot a bunch of marks out of curiosity. Mm-hmm. And I took it home and shot a bunch of marks, and then I was going to check the guy that came home to grade my pool. Yeah. I was going to check his marks. Uh-huh. So I did, I the night before, I set it up and shot myself a bunch of marks. I didn't say anything to the guy. And then when he came in and set it up and got ready to, you know, then I went and checked him. Uh-huh. So Was he on the money? Well, he did his job. Good, yeah. good. Still got the pool today. Looks, got it, you know, got it. It survived. Yeah, wow, dude, you've been there a long time, huh? Yeah, I, go, I moved into that house in uh, Christmas of 82. No shit. Yeah, been there ever since. Wow, you're going to make some money on that fucker. Well, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, that's uh, that's a long, good good neighborhood. Yeah. Your yeah, kids was... went to the schools and everything in there. Right. Raised your kids? Yeah. You got a couple boys in the trade too, right? Yeah, I got uh, Adam and Kyle, my oldest and my youngest. Mm-hmm. Decided they, they wanted to do this. My middle son, Marcus, worked a few summers and worked with Kyle a few times. And he said, I'm not working with him. <laughs> I'm working with Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle was Kyle is a ball buster. Uh-huh. Okay. And uh, so, anyway, Marcus just decided it wasn't for him. So mm-hmm. he went on to college and got a bachelor's degree. And he was going to be a golf course superintendent. But in the meantime, he did a uh, an intern, intern with a... Uh, seed manufacturer Mm -hmm. and uh, they ended up offering him a job after after he got out of school and he took the job and he's been there ever since you know he graduated on saturday and monday morning he was on a plane to oregon to uh for training no shit so and he's been there ever since he's doing real good for himself how how many years has that been jeez probably 10 or 15 oh no shit going on that long maybe wow wow and he's the oldest middle one middle one yeah Got it. So your old, oldest and your youngest got into the trade. Yeah. And and they've got ten years plus. Yeah, Adam's got age. ten. He started he started in eighteen. Adam decided that he wanted to be a paramedic. So he was working for me on and off, and really wasn't feeling, mm-hmm. you know, what we were what we had to offer, you know. Yeah. So he decided he wanted to be a paramedic. So he went to school and started going through all that stuff, and then. Um, he decided, well, maybe I'll give it another shot, you know, came back and, mm-hmm. and he took it just, he caught fire mm-hmm. and, uh, he's doing a great job. He's coming along. He's a solid foreman. And uh, They're, are they both running work? Yeah. No shit. Yeah. Congratulations on that. Yeah. I'm pretty happy. That's Kyle, awesome. Kyle moved, he went to Trendex and he's running work for Trendex. I've got it. Got uh, it. So, and then Adam, uh, has been running work for me here. Got it. And they were trained as lathers. Yep. Mm-hmm. So they, it, it changed when they came in too. So it was, uh, the carpenters had taken over the lathers. Right. So they get trained a little bit different. But right. at Rutherford, you guys still do a lot of lath and plaster. Right. So they, they learn these exteriors, how they get put together. Well, you ask them and they'll tell you they're lathers. Nice. Nice. That's good. That's good. Well, it's in the blood, you know, it yeah, is. Right. So you have one of them, one of them is working for PCI now. Adam's over there temporarily till we, uh, till something good starts here and I can bring him back and put him on it. Mm-hmm. He's one of your key guys. Yeah. Running, running jobs for you. Money maker. He is. He's yeah. done real good. Um, he did a great job for me during the summer on those schools that we picked up in, uh, Garden Grove. We had five schools in Garden Grove that were, uh, real tough mm-hmm. they wanted them done yesterday and uh he just he ramrodded them and pushed them hard mm-hmm. and he did uh peter's elementary school and it was the biggest one i put him out there on purpose it was the biggest one and his numbers were uh the best of the bunch i was nice. real proud of that good everybody else works hard too yeah okay and they and they're, they're, they're each one of those schools had its own challenges sure you know and then he went over he finished up early finished his and then he went and finished uh, another one and i took the guy that was in that last one pulled him out and you know brad and i went over the numbers and we were a little disappointed mm-hmm. you know but it's it was a tough go yeah and brad and i have talked about it got it so and i have to say that uh, those schools were tough in a lot of ways because I went from eight guys on my payroll to over 40 in three days. Holy shit. Wow. Yeah. And I drove Rose Breeden, our human resources gal, out of her mind. Oh, and I'm surprised that she still talks to me. 
but she weathered the storm. She came through like a champ. Yeah. Told you, Rose, I'd uh, plug you. Yeah, good, good. And Teresa Rutherford, yeah. man, I'll tell you, I've come into that office for 25 years now, and I have yet to get there before her. Well, she's got to get your coffee on, bro. Oh, yeah. man, I'll tell you. I don't know. She said this morning, she says, I just stay here all the time. I don't go home, you know. And she's I, I dedicated, dude. I believe her. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know, and she's then, you know, so she's knocking it out. And we got a new gal, uh, Christy Randall, who's coming along. She's doing a great job too. You know, she really supports the field, and we need mm -hmm. that. We mm -hmm. need the girls to have our backs and to be able to process all the paperwork and get everything going. Yeah, and, and uh, we got a great office staff. And then Linda has been there for probably longer than she wants me to mention, but uh, yeah, she's a rock too. Yeah, she's still there. Yeah, oh yeah, she handles all the trucks and the licensing and Holy and all of that. And, and I, God knows what else she handles. I don't know, but I, she's done everything in there, yeah. payroll and oh, you name it. Linda can do it. Yeah, wow, she's still there. Yeah, That's, dude, I remember we'd go to work there when we were kids in the summer <laughs> at at the yard over there. Right. You know, just they were building panels and and you know they'd have like a bunch of old studs that they did on this demo job and they were actually still the studs were good so right. we were taking screws out of the studs <laughs> and stacking them up Thank and i remember you. i remember linda as i was a little kid we'd go there in the summer and work and uh, i'm blown away that she's hasn't retired yet no she says she's not going <clears throat> to she says she just she likes it. She says it's, what's, it's what keeps her going. Amazing. And uh, she's going to do it till, you know. She can't. Till God calls her home. Wow. So. Dedication, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They have some long-term employees there. Did you ever um, have, did you ever want to not manage the field and go into project management <clears throat> no. or estimating? No, I wanted, I wanted to uh, call the shots. Mm-hmm. In the field yeah and and uh work issues out with your foreman right so do you get involved in pre-construction a, a bit yeah yeah th th when, when we do shop drawings ben stratton in our office um as, as a whiz on the uh on the uh, computer with the uh, details and that sort of thing and mm -hmm. so i'll work with him hand in glove but you know from time to time he'll call and ask me hey what do you think about this should we do this should we do that? how should we frame this that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And Ben does a lot of our uh, design build shop drawings. Got or it. He'll work with, with a structural engineer and Brian, all the guys in there, mm -hmm. you know, are pretty adept at uh, what's going on there with the computers. Got it. Got it. But you, when they have difficult jobs that they're looking at, then, then they'll call you up and say, yeah. Hey Mike, what do you think of this? Well, right. Well, they'll know, ask me it. to come in and they, you know, they'll call me and Hey, come on up here for a minute, you know? Mm -hmm. So then I, I know we're, we've got to sure. look at something. Something's on their mind. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we'll put our heads together and come up with something that works. Mm -hmm. What do you think of these new apprentices that are that are in the game? Are they uh, are they starting to get it? Are they having to deal with them a little bit different than what was happening in the past? You, you, uh, you know as well as I do that it's a whole different world, and you can't um, you can't tell things to people like you used to. Mm -hmm. You know. So like, uh, you know, my dad was tough on me when I was a kid. He did it for a reason, you know. When I when I finally left the house, I took his boot out of my ass and left it on the front porch. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I finally left. Yeah. And once I got to the job site, the first couple of weeks there and I made a mistake or I did something wrong and Manuel chew my ass, you know, I'd walk away thinking under my breath, laughing, going, <laughs> you want to hurt my feelings? You have to do a lot better than that. Mm -hmm. that ain't shit mm -hmm. and ass chew and i used to get that's nothing that's yeah. laughable yeah you know so i was used to uh, there was no there's no shock to me when i got an ass chew and it wouldn't didn't bother me mm -hmm. i took it to heart don't get me wrong sure but my feelings were definitely not hurt got it right? got it yeah working for the boss isn't uh what everybody thinks it is <laughs> it's tough man yeah it's tough you can bust your ass all day long yeah. all day long okay take two seconds I mean, literally two seconds. You take your hard hat off and you go like this, and that's all everybody sees. And says, "Look at that son of a bitch." He's standing with his finger in his ass. Yep. You know? <laughs> exactly. And you only did it once. And you only did it once. And yeah. I'm not kidding you. Yeah. How long does it take you to take your hard hat off yeah. and like that? And put your hard hat back. And on? that's that's when your old man walked on the job too. Oh yeah, and he looked at me. What the he, fuck are you doing? Yeah. 
Exactly. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Stand here with my finger in my ass, Dad. Yeah. You know, of course, yeah. you don't say that. Yeah. I mean, no, but that's that, that's oh, yeah. weird how that timing works, too, right? Oh, yeah. You know? It, it happens to me. I go on the job, and my sons are the same thing. Yeah. I walk in there, and I, and I always catch them at the worst time. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah that is I, so amazing. And I, I think to myself, <clears throat> <laughs> what have I done wrong here? Yeah, and then I go, and then I think also, well, Ben had done that. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. So, yeah, that's uh, that, what do they? What do they think of these? Are are they good with these new apprentices? Are they taking them under their wing and and showing them different ways how to do this stuff? Yeah, they're making an effort. I think that we're we're adapting, and some of these guys that are of that generation mm -hmm. are getting up there. So they know how to deal yeah. with that, mm -hmm. you know, and they know that you can't say this or you can't say that, but mm -hmm. they still, you know, Hey man, uh, Adam has a, a fr uh, an apprentice that he's kind of working with. His name's Tyler and he'll chew Tyler's ass, but he has a relationship with him mm -hmm. right? and Tyler's coming up. He's going to be a good hand too. Got it. Got it. So, well, that shit, look, I've talked about this before. It builds character. Do they have to be certified welders now when they turn out? Well, yeah. You have to go through a two-week class. Your last two weeks of your apprenticeship mm -hmm. is spent in welding school, and they come out with an AWS certification, which is the only thing anybody seems to care about anymore, the L.A. City Certified Welder, which is what I had to be. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a I, – I, I think it's still there, but nobody really asks for it. You get that rare occasion where somebody wants somebody L.A. City certified. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a guy that is, so – Got it. Do you, do you still have your, do you, did you keep yours up? No. Yeah. You're not going to be getting behind the hood anytime nah, soon, huh? No. Nah. No. My dad had a welding machine he brought home in the garage and he taught us to weld. Mm -hmm. And I was welding kids forks back together in the neighborhood and bikes. And I was making money welding shit up for guys in the neighborhood. I'll no. weld that for you for three bucks. You know? No shit. Oh yeah. We were <laughs> I'd weld up Dude, shit. you were pretty enterprising as a kid. <laughs> Charge some guys money for that shit. Good for you. Yeah, I, had, I, had, I had my own business at 10. Is I that went, right? Oh, yeah. I was a gardener, baby. Yeah. I cut anybody's lawn that let me. Yeah. You know, Get her I'd, done. I'd work for a couple hours in the morning, and then that was it. And I'd go down and play baseball the rest of the day down mm -hmm. at the school. Got it. So, But I, from the time I was 10 uh, until I was 14, 14 or 15, I got a job at McDonald's. When I was 14 and a half and I lied about my age because you got to be 15 to work there. And the guy, the guy let me work there for almost a year. Really? Before I was old enough. Wow. Yeah. So, Dude, you're a worker. So, yeah. So I had, I had, I bought a 68 Camaro when I turned 16 and I had saved half of it. I had nine, $800 saved up oh, from shit. cutting lawns mm -hmm. and, and then working at McDonald's for maybe, well, maybe a year. No shit. Yeah, well, I'd I'd save. I, I was a saver. Good you for know, you. Put that stuff in the bank. But but what motivated mm -hmm. me to start mowing lawns is my dad gave me what I needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, he wouldn't give me what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanted to wear Levi's and a J C Penney's particular style of t shirt, the thick ones, the mm -hmm. good ones, not the ones that you put on and you can see your tits through. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Which is what I got. You yeah, know, I okay. wanted I wanted the other ones. Got it. But if I wanted those, I'm gonna have to go buy them myself. Mm -hmm. So at ten years old, I started mowing lawns and I started buying my own Levi's because mm -hmm. I wanted a pair of Levi's. Yeah. So and he taught me if you want it, then you get it. I'll give you this. I'll give you these J.C. Penney tough skins. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then also I had to wear those to school, and then I got made fun of. Well, the first time somebody made fun of me wearing those pants, I beat the living shit out of them, mm -hmm. and nobody made fun of me wearing those pants. Got it. You know. Got it. But I didn't like wearing those pants because right. then the girls would laugh at you. Yeah. So you were you you knew what you wanted. So I knew what I wanted, and then mm -hmm. I had to go get it. Yeah. So. And you were willing to do that. Well, I was, yeah, I was more than willing to do it. Yeah. And, and I was and mowing the, this woman's yard backyard one time, <clears throat> and the weeds were really high. And man, it was, it was killing me. And I'm mowing along, and all of a sudden I run into something. Like, what the fuck? So I pulled the weeds back, and there was a go-kart, a two-man go-kart in there. <laughs> I said, wow, look at this, man. I, her name was Mrs. Vickers, and her daughter's name was Kathy Vickers. And Kathy had everything, okay? She'd play with it for two minutes and, th and then walk away from it. So they bought her this go-kart, and she rode it around the backyard. <laughs> and anyway, 
I asked her if I could have the go-kart and she said, yeah, go ahead, get it out of here. So I took the go-kart out of there and it had a five horse Briggs and Stratton motor. Nice. On. So I took it home and fooled around with it. And my dad helped me clean it out and get it running. And we spent the whole summer riding that go-kart around in the neighborhood. My brother and I rode that. Thing. That's we, badass. Dude. We rode the wheels off that thing. And that was bitch. We were driving around the neighborhood like we had a car. Yeah. Okay, and it, yeah. it opened up a lot of areas for us. To oh, go I'll to. bet, dude. I'll we went bet. all over that neighborhood. Because uh, five horsepower on it, it, mini bikes and shit like that, yeah. they were like you know two and a half, three horsepower. So if somebody had a five horsepower, they were badass. Well, if we had we had, we had horse five and a half horsepower, we were hot shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we knew it. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. That <laughs> was totally awesome. One time, my brother and I, and there was a good friend of mine. It was John Ketman. He lived out the end of the street. He was like a a third son to my dad mm -hmm. and we were like sons to his, to his dad. We were a very tight family. Yeah. And so John got on the back, my brother's next to me and I'm riding and we had these goofy ass little football helmets on. Okay. And they were just like strap and plastic, you know, yeah. we, at least we had the sense to put a football helmet on. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So John goes, okay. And we went a little faster into the turn every time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the last time through, he goes, okay, Open it up, man. And it was full throttle. He overrid the governor. And that thing was hauling ass. And I went into that curve and it, ooh, <laughs> we rolled it, rolled the thing. And my brother, no I, I was afraid we got, that he got hurt because he was on the bottom. Ah. And he crawled out of there and we were laughing our asses off. Oh, my God. Oh, we almost made it. That was bitching. Yeah, yeah. God we're, damn. We're, we're scraped up from head to toe and we're laughing our asses off. That is funny, dude. But it was fun. You, we you, were, uh, you were a hustler back then, man. Was Ronnie like that too? Yeah. Oh yeah, he was right yeah. alongside me. Got it. So you guys were tight all all through growing up and everything. Yeah. Good, really good friends, and mm -hmm. you still are. Yeah. You guys work work together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We done a lot of stuff together. We had when when he moved out, we had a falling out, and then he he uh, uh, probably about we didn't talk to each other for I don't know. It felt like five or six months. It was probably two weeks. But anyway, he, 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 we had a little rough patch there, when we, and we just, we kind of fell apart a little bit. And then, you know, things changed for us, and I went over to his house where he was living, mm -hmm. and uh, had a party over there, and I never looked back. I was buy one. It was like it never happened. Mm -hmm. I walked into the house, gave him a hug, like it never happened, and we just kept, been, on, been kept on going on. Bros. Yeah, absolutely. Good. That's nice. Yeah, when I retired, I, I'll miss seeing him in the mornings. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys may retire at the same time though, right? Uh, it's a good possibility. We're talking about it. Yeah. 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 You're getting tired. Well, it's just, it's just catching up to us. That's yeah. all, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, um, like I say, we got some good years left in us and there's some things we want to accomplish before, before, um, we leave, mm -hmm. you know, and I've talked to Paul and Brad about that. Yeah. And I want to, I want to, uh, get through a good push get the company in good shape mm -hmm. so david has something to work with when you know by mm -hmm. brad's admission dave's going to kind of be heir apparent to the thing but i want to give i want to give uh put some money in the bank so when dave gets there he's got something to work with mm -hmm. and if they see fit to put one of my sons in there as a superintendent um great but you know we'll cross that bridge when we come to it yeah well he'll have 20 years under his belt then yeah right yeah right yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah you got yeah. some time bro yeah you got some time so what do you what do you do for hobbies and stuff like that oh you know i get off work and go to the gym and just basically i'm you know i'm into the fitness thing mm -hmm. you have yeah. been for a number of years yeah yeah I've, I've been doing it for probably good well last 15 18 years yeah go yeah to that's the gym every night do you every yeah. night yeah. well wednesday nights i don't go because that's my date night got it and uh you know go to the you go to the gym on date night man it's a rookie move Mm -hmm. you know, for don't, sure don't do that yeah so do you take the weekends off uh saturday mornings i go in and uh sundays i usually if, if i do anything i'll go for a hike with my wife mm -hmm. we'll go you know hike on a hiking trail or something sure. like that if the weather's nice yeah so you get a little cardio in there yeah 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 because mostly my work is just it, it, a lot of it's focused on just weight training mm -hmm. yeah you you've got hot and heavy into that i did uh i did in uh between 45 and 52 um, I got real into bodybuilding, mm -hmm. and I did three bodybuilding shows, oh, oh five, uh, seven and eight. I got took it. six off. 
lots of freaking training so, for that, yeah. man. Yeah, it was lots a lot, of training. It was, it was a lot of work. Do you work with a trainer? I did, yeah. Yeah. I don't now, but I did then. Got it. Same gym? No, I'm in a different gym now. <clears throat> but those for those three years, yeah, I did. I worked out of the gym with a guy named Gil uh, Gilbert Martinez. Mm -hmm. Great guy. He was like this close to turning pro. He was Is that a beast. Right? Really? Yeah, and he wanted his pro card, and his problem was he thought he he thought the judges didn't treat him fairly, and the judges. You don't piss off a body train a bodybuilding judge. Just don't piss one off. No, they'll never give you. You'll never get your pro card. Right. And he right. kind of blackballed himself, mm -hmm. unfortunately for him, because the guy had pro muscle. Mm -hmm. He could he could have gone into to the IFBB pro ranks. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he knew the sport. He knew the business. He knew me. Mm -hmm. He knew my body, and he knew how to train me. He did mm -hmm. a great job. He Lots knew. of dedication, dude. What's the toughest thing I ever did? Yeah, that's but you were you were totally into fitness before you stepped into that part of the arena, right? I mean, uh, you, you know, you what? were dedicated. I had, yeah, I did. After the kids got older, I didn't do when I was younger, and I started having kids, and they came into the to to our lives. I was all family, you know. I didn't mm -hmm. have time. I told myself I didn't have time to run or train or any of that kind of stuff, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I was down at the Little League field five nights a week with three different teams at one time. I had three teams. No shit. You know, so yeah. I'm down there throwing batting practice. And, you know, so I was active, mm -hmm. you know, but still, I, I, I you know, I, I put on a gut, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a life changing experience at 45. My my little bride of 22 years came home and told me she wasn't happy. Got it. So. You know that that was that was a life changing experience for me. Twenty two years you were married. Yeah, I was married for twenty two wow. years. Wow, yeah. did you got married young then? I married twenty three. Got it, yeah. got it. And you had you had kids young. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I was twenty eight when we started having kids. So um, I thought we did it right. Yeah. You know, we got mm -hmm. married. We took five years to get to know each other and mm -hmm. to build some wealth and and to get set in our careers. And sure. I was I was a journeyman. I was running work actually before um, I had kids. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was on my way and she was a nurse and she was doing her thing. Oh, you guys were doing well. So we were, yeah, we were in good shape. We yeah. were doing well. We both knew what we wanted to do and we were moving those directions. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we'd go out and party and whip it up and, yeah. you know, go go dancing and go clubbing and, mm -hmm. and we did all that stuff. Took some nice vacations and, sure. you know, and then one Christmas rolled around and mm -hmm. we just, it was one of those things where we felt like something was missing and we knew what it was. And so the next Christmas we had a kid. Got it. You Got know, it. Kyle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just went on from there. So I, you know, like I say, I thought I did it right, but apparently I, I did something wrong and, you know, so, but anyway, you know, I, I like I say, I made the best out of it. And, um, and you I, really went hot and heavy into fitness. Yeah. Yeah. I got into running cause I wanted to lose weight, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, my first, my goal was to drop some weight for, uh, my birthday. So in August I started training or just running. Mm -hmm. Just all I was doing was walking. And I'm walking up and down this hill, and it's just killing me, man. I'm so, I'm out of shape. You know, I'm fat. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 220, and I'm wearing 38 Levi's. And I'm busting on that's, that's Hey, just, they weren't fucking tough skins, were they? Oh, no. They were okay. Levi's. Right. Button, <laughs> button fly, too, baby. Oh, yeah. So, so, yeah, I used my last uh, lawn mowing money to get those things. But anyway... Uh, yeah, so I start, I'm walking, and this guy comes running past me, like you know, like he's running like the wind, and it pissed me off, because I felt like a, I felt like that rock, that skinny guy on the beach, and when they're kidding, the muscle guy's kicking sand in his face, you know, mm -hmm, those, mm -hmm. remember those old cartoons? Sure. I thought you son of a bitch, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be doing that. So about mm -hmm. a year, it took about a year before I started was able to start you know running like that, and from August until. Uh, to my birthday in February, uh, I, I went from 220 to 180. Holy shit. So in that time frame. And all running. All, it was all running. Yeah, I wasn't going into the gym yet and training with weights. It was just running. Wow, that is huge, dude. And so I'd get on there and I'd like trade one pain for another. Mm -hmm. You know, because I was really struggling with my divorce. It, mm -hmm. was, it, was, it was beating me up. Yeah. And, and all the guys will tell you that. Mm -hmm. They were all with me. Jim mm -hmm. Sr. got me through it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. That, yeah, but, uh, you know, I'd get on that hill and start running, and I'd run till it hurt, and then I was, you know, it took the place of the other one. 
Sure. And took my mind off of it. Yeah. And it was a way to get over it. And well, I did. Yeah. And it, it was, uh, you had a goal too, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, one of my friends said, hey, there's a competition f uh, called Run to the Top. And it starts in the parking lot at Mount Baldy. And you run to the peak. Okay. So it goes from 6,500. It, it gains... Um, it, it gains uh, from 6,500 to 1,100 feet, to 11,000 feet at the, at the top in eight miles. It's only eight miles, but it's like straight up. Ah. So I thought, wow, yeah, maybe I should try that. So I went ahead and did that, and uh, I wanted to do it in an hour, uh, under two hours. So mm -hmm. I did it an hour and 45 minutes. So I, was, you know, I thought, well, that's cool. I, yeah, I made my goal. Wow. So I'm coming back down, and coming back down is no cakewalk either. Let me tell you. It just beats the daylights out of your quads coming downhill. Mm -hmm. So these two young guys come flying past me. They're running downhill. And the one says, man, that's tougher than any marathon I've ever run. And I thought, mm. well, that was tough, but it wasn't that tough. Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, maybe I should, maybe I, you know, so the thought occurred to me to run a marathon. So Romero, who works for Rutherford, the scaffold builder, um, he was, he gave me a book to train with and the book had certain, you know, steps that you went and mm -hmm. I followed the training schedule in the book that, cause Romero runs, uh, runs, uh, marathons. Got it. Yeah. So, uh, I started training with that and I ended up doing a marathon in 2002 and I wanted to do it in under six hours and I did it in five hours and no, I wanted to do it under five hours and I did it in four hours and 50 minutes. No shit. Yeah. The L.A. Marathon. Yeah, L.A. City Marathon. I did it in four hours and 50 minutes. Where do, where do you see the industry going in the next 10 years? What do you see happening? I mean, there's all this new uh, layout technology that's out there and stuff. I'm not sure if you guys are taking advantage of any of that shit. But, uh, what, I'm aware what, of all that. Mm -hmm. okay? But you need big projects mm -hmm. to use a, utilize a lot of that. Justify stuff. it. Yeah. yeah, and some of that stuff. Uh, one of the guys at Westside... Uh, exposed me to it and said, Hey, check this thing out. You know, it's like 12 to 18 grand, something like that for this stuff to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're, if you've got a 26 story high rise, yeah, you want to use that. You want to mm -hmm. take advantage of it. Yeah. You know, so it's all, and if something happened, oh, I would approach the Rutherfords and we'd get one. Got it. Got it. Yeah. That shit's moving kind of quick now. And we'd do it. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, but uh, as far as, um, you don't see lath and plaster going away, do you? Uh, uh, I don't think so. I don't see that going away. I think and you mentioned something in your in one of your podcasts that you see EFIS coming, making a bit of a return. Yeah, it's you know, it, it's I'm trying to out here on the west coast because that Title Twenty Four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that that EFIS. I see EFIS maybe making a a comeback. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, they they uh, everybody's jockeying for position on the on the Title Twenty Four stuff and. Um, They've learned some very valuable lessons, very mm -hmm. expensive lessons mm -hmm. on how that stuff gets put together and drained. And now with all this liquid applied that there's a lot of different liquid applied manufacturers out there, um, that's that's helping that cladding, you know, and, mm -hmm. it's, and what it has going for it is, is it's continuous insulation. It really is continuous. You know, there's some versions of it that they will do mechanical fasteners, but I think for the most part, it's all a drainable system, right. you know, so it's buttered up on the back and it's stuck on to the um, the, the liquid applied WRB. So that, uh, that has its place, but I know that there's a lot of people that are still very shy and they still can't get insurance on it. They insurance companies don't want to touch it because of what happened, you know, in the early nineties and stuff right. with all the failures. And, um, but they're, they're coming out with new, new ways and different ways to drain it and so forth. And, and everybody wants the latest and greatest Sure. and wants to be the latest and greatest. Yeah. So, um, you know, lot, lots of different, you know, cement panel siding, uh, fiber cement panel siding and phenolics and uh, like we've said on previous episodes that metal panels aren't new anymore right it's just been out for a long time yeah, yeah. i did a metal panel job fire command center in 1990 the whole job the whole thing was a luca bond panels mm -hmm. okay and an outfit out of utah 
and their iron workers came out and installed it. And there wasn't a stitch of black paper behind it, nothing. No shit. Nope. Open framing with nothing behind it. Really? Watertight Luca Bomb panel. Fire Command Center off of Eastern and the 10 Freeway. Got it. And that, that Fire Command was a unique building. It sat on isolator pads, mm-hmm. the whole building. And it had a moat around it. You could look underneath it. Huh. To this day, you can go over there and look underneath it. And where all the columns or the beams were on the outside corners of the build, outsides of the building, mm-hmm. they had skirts that came down to hide the isolator pads. And that building, it had a series of plates with a rubber jacket around it, and the plates were all greased, and it had a giant chain in the middle, and the bottom of the beam had a hook on it, and the chain came in and hooked the beam down, and there was another beam that and it came down to a rod that was embedded into the, to the footing. Mm-hmm. And they say that the thing will move 18 inches. No in, in shit. In any direction. Wow. You don't have to worry about nothing cracking either because it's all metal. That was a yeah. great job. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you learned some shit on that oh, too. Oh, boy. Yeah. That was a good learning career with me, Chuck Dominguez. Craig Owens was out there with me. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a whole host of guys out there. Yeah. And you talk about safety. And I was going to go there when you said, what do you see the industry doing? Mm-hmm. And I think the safety thing, somewhere along the line, it has to bottom out. Yeah. The, the quote unquote paranoia mm-hmm. over safety. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm all about safety. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Okay. But I think too much of a good thing can be just as bad. I agree. And, and, and I just, I'm fearful that we're, we're just too far that mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it gives, I think that it could tend to, it lends itself to giving a person a false sense of security mm-hmm. and could uh, possibly let him let his guard down as all of it and be just as much danger and present just as much danger as not being safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I worked on some crazy stuff. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we did it together. Yeah. You know, how many times we go into a stairwell with an extension ladder and a single jack. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah. And rip through that stairwell yep. and board it up where today they, they wouldn't have even had the scaffold built by the time we rocked it and we were out of there. Okay. But we knew what we were on mm-hmm. and we knew what our limitations and were. And we paid attention and we were cognizant of yeah. where our feet were, what we were doing. Sure. Okay. And we knew that we could fall. Oh yeah. Okay. And we knew how to keep from falling and we didn't. Mm-hmm. Okay. But we were, we were comfortable yeah. there. If you weren't comfortable there, you couldn't get on it. it sure. Exactly. And you wouldn't. Mm-hmm. You knew, you said, uh, I've done it before. I put stuff up and I went, I'm going to fall. I'm, this is stupid. I'm going to go on my ass. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And the other thing is too, is what I always kind of looked at when I was in that situation is I always, I always felt uncomfortable if I didn't have something to hang on to if, mm-hmm. if, it, if it was ready to fall. Right. Right. If yeah. it was, if I was going to go down and I didn't have something to grab onto, it made me a little shaky. You know, mm-hmm. like even when you're hanging those those stairwells, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when you when you got the last course up there, up at the lid, and there was nothing to grab onto, right. just in case yeah. it did go. Yeah. Th- that you know, you're a little. You get the feeling in your hands. Right? Yeah. You know, you're getting you a little sweaty, a little, right? You get a little itchy. Yeah. Go, yeah. Boy, am I glad I'm done? Yeah. And um, but other than that, as long as I. For myself, as long as I knew that I had something to grab onto, if it let go, then I, right. I felt comfortable. And like even working in uh, elevator shafts before they were going to open the buildings, a lot of times we would get some OT and we would go in there and make sure that there were no ledges on right. the inside of the shaft for, you know, if they were making repairs that a wrench was going to fall or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, we were in control of the car. And it was silent death because you always kept everything in nice and tight for the counterweights. Right. Because you can't hear them. Right. You know, and those, they don't stop. And that was kind of freaking eerie. Yeah, it's a little spooky. I I do remember that. You know, working in those shafts, man. That was the only thing you had to worry about was on counterweights. Exactly. And those were no joke. Those things came by you, and there was God knows how many. And they were a stack this tall. Yeah, dude, it was silent death too, man. You know, you couldn't hear them coming. Right. You know, oh, yeah, they were dead and silent. we were jogging and it wasn't like we were, you know, flying this thing. They, they had it in jog mode for us, mm-hmm. but still, yeah, right. you know, yeah, it was it was kind of crazy. But yeah, I don't know. Out of all the years that I worked in the field, there was never any major injuries on the job. 
No, I never had anybody seriously get hurt under my, uh, as I was a foreman, run and work. Even, um, even like other trades, you know, when right. I was working, and we were working on these fucking jobs with like 350 guys on them, right. you know, between yeah. all the trades, right? right. Yeah. Some, sometimes 500 men on these jobs. Sure. And um, everybody was, uh, I don't know, it was just, uh, they were paying attention. And everybody wanted to go home that night, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And there was, um, but they weren't, they weren't real crazy about the safety stuff. No. No, it wasn't you know? overboard. No. That fire command center I tell you about. Mm -hmm. uh, I ordered, pre-ordered all the studs because it was all spandrel, mm -hmm. you know. And so I was able to, uh, and I did a lot of jig work. Okay. I jigged up a lot of stuff out there. And uh, I was stocking the top, the roof. So uh, I had the studs cut to size. They, I don't think they were more than four or five feet. So I put six of them across the basket, a boom lift. Mm -hmm. And I and there was a moat there, so I had to boom out. So it was a three two two story building. So I start uh, booming out, and I get up there, get up there again. And I was going to take the studs out and put them on the roof. And then I got up to a certain point, the ass end of the scissor lift came up, and the basket went forward. Oh shit! And I hit the bent plate. Oh my god! Bam! Did so, you have a brown spot in your fucking pants? Uh, it got my attention. Yeah. So I I I did I didn't I didn't. Uh, panic luckily i took the studs and i put the studs out and as soon as i did the weight off the basket and the thing came back oh my god okay yeah so i go all right that wasn't so bad i went back down i blocked the tires and i did it again and i stocked the whole building Zzz, boom mm -hmm. stocked the whole building wow every single time the tires came up i tried to put cement <sighs> on the bass end of it you know but yeah. we didn't there was just some concrete crap out there we weren't plastering anything got it got i was it. doing something trying to wait down to keep the ass in from coming because yeah. i had to get that thing stocked sure we were going to get up there the next day and yeah. and that we were moving our way up right right you know i had to get it done man. get her done yeah so i blocked the wheels so i knew the wheels wouldn't slide out from under me and i said shit this piece of cake right <laughs> Bam, I hit the bent plate, I drop them off, and they can go back, and I drop back down. And I got to the point where I'd throw them off, and before the thing started to rock back, I'd start pulling back on the lever, so coming back wasn't so much. Got it, got it. It was already starting to move back. Yeah, yeah. So I got pretty good at it. All right, all right, you I got it doing, done, man. Hey, I stocked the roof, and I lived to tell about it. That's yeah. probably the stupidest thing I've done. And and uh, nobody down there with a um, an iPad writing you up right well nobody was down there taking a picture of me yeah. that's for sure yeah yeah like they would be today got it got it yeah it's uh there there's a balance to that yeah. just yeah. like everything in life right right oh yeah you know, say so they sometimes uh, they tend to go overboard on i that. got away with that one yeah as i look back i got away with it yeah yeah Lucky. yeah well at least you blocked the tires when you got down to the you, bottom you, so the fucker wouldn't roll backwards right, right i figured if i can lock these tires in yeah because there's no way i'm it's gonna take me i don't know how long to get those studs to that roof because it was a good footprint yeah it was a big building yeah yeah and, uh, these are great stories dude thanks really appreciate you coming in here and telling oh. your story and people are going to want to hear this because everybody started at the bottom yeah and uh you found yourself a kick-ass career to get into and it sounds like you had some fun what a blast doing it you know yeah. and uh you still have some time to go yeah you know? that's uh, i'm looking forward to the time i have left and i'm gonna make the most of it good for you good for I you i got some things i want to accomplish yeah still that's and, awesome uh, that's awesome god willing yeah congratulations thank you that's awesome thanks mike thanks for coming in man rob my pleasure buddy i really enjoyed it all right good job bro